Victor Valley Bible Church family, thank you for joining us this morning, and God bless you on this beautiful Lord's Day, May 17th, 2020. want to extend also a very uh, warm welcome to those who are worshiping with us this morning and attending to the reading of God's Word, prayer, uh, a few announcements, and the preaching of God's Word, who are not a regular part of our church family. We're grateful for this wonderful outreach that God has given us uh, to uh, reach others beyond the uh, typical scope of our almost five acres of property in Victorville. So we're so glad you all are with us. I wanted to also um, give you an idea. It's been suggested by some of our number that uh, video conferencing, which is all the rage now during these uh, shutdown times, uh, is a really the best way at this time for us to fellowship with one another. And uh, we convene video conferencing on Wednesday nights in our Bible study, Thursday evenings in our Awana Club, and our Saturday, excuse me, in our Saturday men's Bible studies. And we find it uh, worthwhile. Uh, in fact, uh, later this afternoon, I'll be having a video conference with a family in our congregation to go over their Awana verses that their boys and girls have been working hard on. Also, uh, our three boys, Andrew, Daniel, and Stephen, they in May, and their grandparents will be joining on a video conferencing family get-together today. Everyone, of course, in different places. But uh, this is um, a good thing to consider. Uh, for fellowship with one another after church, if you will, after the Sunday sermon time. Uh, you can discuss the sermon, you can share prayer requests, pray with one another, these kinds of things. And it's actually really worthwhile. And I encourage you to consider doing that. Some of us are already familiar with the video platform. We use Zoom. So let me suggest you select some friends and invite them to join you for fellowship around that platform. Uh, Google Hangouts is another. There are other various platforms, if you will, and mediums for doing so. So let me encourage you again to make time with one another via these outlets. No one, as one of our own mentioned this morning, or in a previous text, likes this home church. Church is not church when the only members of your church are the people you live with day in and day out in your home. You might have fellowship, you might have uh, Bible reading and prayer, as any family should. But that is not church. We need to interact and mingle with one another. And uh, this is the best way we know how to do this for now. Um, so let me again urge you to consider doing that if you don't already. There's other means to get together. So Try that out. Also, I wanted to let you folks know uh, that if you would like to donate, make any donations or offerings to Victor Body Bible Church online, we hope to have that particular program available to our church and those who wish to give uh, via our website as well as our Facebook page by the end of this coming week. Uh, we've worked with a company called Heartland, recommended to us by our friends at Desert Community Bank. And uh, we believe that we'll have a good relationship with those dear folks. So uh, look for that uh, tab. It'll be an icon of some kind uh, on our Facebook page as well as our um, regular uh, website page. So that's coming up hopefully later this week. Continue to pray with one another and pray for one another. I want to I remind you also to pray for our friend Josie Marquez, whose husband passed away just last week. And uh, continue to uplift her in your prayers and her and her family as they adjust to uh, a, a, new, uh, a new normal for them. Uh, her husband was such a, such a good man and a, a good friend. So we're going to uh, direct our attention to the reading of God's Word. And if you'd open your Bibles with me to Psalm 96. Psalm 96. We're going to... Uh, to Read that passage of scripture and then pray with one another. Um, I wanted to welcome as well. Uh, I can see here that Patrick's uh, joined us. Good morning, sir. 
Roger and Isabel, always a delight to know you folks are worshiping with us, and I so appreciate your support. Andrew, as always, it's great to see you. Thank you, son, for being a part of things. We hope to see you and your brothers later this afternoon on Zoom. And uh, Robert and Jade and family, God bless you. Thank you for being a part of our of our meeting this morning. I know there are others as well that are just as enthusiastic uh, for this fellowship, but aren't uh, necessarily officially logged in. So again, welcome to everyone. So we're going to read Psalm 96, and then I'll lead us in prayer, and then we're going to direct our attention to the reading of Philippians chapter 2 and the exposition of that chapter. Psalm 96, a song of praise to God, coming in judgment. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Amen. Let's pray together. Thank you, our Father, for this 96th Psalm. What a tremendous statement this is. In a world, as we know, even now, ravaged by plague and virus, as it has been subjected for all these centuries, Lord, for many, many years, and your creation groaning with groanings that long and express its longing for, for, the, uh, uh, for the new creation and for the judgment, for the judge of the world to come. We thank you, our Father, for this psalm as it reminds us of uh, how you established the earth and it shall not be moved. It seems in these days, Lord, that there is great moving, there is great changing, and there is great instability and great chaos and great frustration, and many people wringing their hands, and politicians and world leaders alike, uncertain, and their decisions fluctuating, and no one really seems to speak consistently, and the citizens of our nations in this world are, are so frustrated and eager to get back to work, and eager to worship, and eager to be back in church, and eager to be with their families, and and live lives normally. And it's, it's, it's so, uh, so frustrating for so many people. So we thank you that this psalm here reminds us that you reign, that you are the God who has established his throne in the heavens and whose sovereignty rules over all, that our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases in heaven and on earth. And you will judge the peoples, the nations, righteously. As it says in verse 10, and as it concludes this psalm, judging the world with righteousness and the peoples with your truth, you are coming. And our Lord Jesus Christ said that he is coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Lord, we pray that when you return, we may be found faithful, serving you, recklessly giving ourselves over to selfless service to the King of kings and Lord of lords, and being unselfishly devoted to the better of other people. You are great, greatly to be praised, feared above all things, and we worship you this morning and thank you for being with us, for each of us, Lord. Thank you for our beloved congregation. Thank you for those who serve. Thank you for those who work. Thank you for the Wieson family that's been working lately and making our building there at the church look presentable again. Thank you, Father, for our dear sister Josie, whose husband is with you in Christ, with you in heaven with you in paradise. And we thank you, Father, for that wonderful assurance. May you bless and encourage Josie today and uh, Lawrence and Linda and Lori and Patrick and Dennis as they uh, consider the hope of heaven and the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to die for our sins and rise again and come again 
as we believe he is. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Lord, we pray that through whatever means you give us, we may be faithful to proclaim the good news of your, sal of your salvation from day to day, and declare your glory among the nations and your wonders among all peoples. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, let's direct our attention quickly now to Philippians chapter 2 for our sermon this morning. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to read the entire chapter for us. This is going to be our last stab at this uh, remarkable chapter, the heart. As I say in the introduction to our online sermon this morning, the heart of the Philippian letter. This uh, letter of the Apostle Paul, the fourth of his so-called prison epistles penned during his two-year confinement in Rome. Recorded for us in Acts chapter 28. And he writes from there the letters to the Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And then since there is comfort or consolation in Christ, the coming alongside of the Lord Jesus Christ, any comfort of love, because there is fellowship of the Spirit and affection and mercy, fulfill my joy, Paul says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loyalness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things of Christ Jesus. But you know him. Yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So let's get started. Let's get started at learning of the life which is in Christ, this marvelous chapter. And we begin with Philippians 2 and verse 3, beginning this chapter with this wonderful imperative. Literally, nothing according to strife or vainglory, but in loyalness of mind, one another let each esteem better than themselves. That's the order in the original language. Very important to observe here. The stress being that nothing of selfish ambition or conceit is to mark Christian fellowship. Rather, and this is a very strong contrasting conjunction, but others first. 
is to be our motto. First in terms of importance. First in terms of interests. And you know that since entering this chapter, we examined the selfless model of our Lord Jesus Christ, verses 5 through 16. The examples of Paul, verses 17 through 18, and Timothy, last time, verses 19 through 24. But there is another, Epaphroditus, the Philippians' messenger, who had contracted a deathly sickness and had recovered, and longed to see his Macedonian family again. It was this man who carried this very letter to the Philippians. These men are selfless servants. Following the pattern originally set by the Lord Jesus, the one who died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again, as 2 Corinthians 5.15 reminds us. These days, as we know, many have selflessly served, and in many cases even yielding up their own lives and their efforts to save one another. On April 3rd, 61-year-old Celia Marcos, a charge nurse at Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, rushed to resuscitate a patient who had tested positive for COVID-19. At the time, she was only wearing a surgical mask and not a more protective N95 mask. Marcos began feeling ill three days later and was admitted to the hospital where she had worked for over a decade on April 15th. Now her fellow doctors and nurses became her caretakers. She died two days later in a statement to the LA Times, Service Employees International Union Local 121 President Nina Wells said, quote, Now we know. Celia Marcos gave her life to try to save a life. And such a story could be multiplied many times over here in our country, around the world. Friends, lives are in danger. And in the course of human history, many have given their lives for the sake of others. Some of them Christians following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and the example set forth here in 49, plague killed its thousands and tens of thousands suddenly and somewhere in Europe. People had to live with the threat of plague entering the gates of their cities. One particularly notable personality is John Calvin and his friends in Geneva, Switzerland. In the fall of 1542, Plague made one of its recurring visits to Geneva, Switzerland, where French reformer John Calvin was leading a theological revolution that was already at work, transforming Europe from a spiritual perspective. And the pastoral issues that arose regarding care for the many sick were very difficult to resolve. Geneva's hospital, called the Plague Hospital, for plague victims is located outside the wall of the city, kept entirely separate as per government orders. Genevans fulfilled the directive, practiced, if you will, social distancing, and separated the sick from the well. But there was a problem for the churches of Geneva. How would pastoral visitation in the hospitals be accomplished? Calvin and what was called the Company of Pastors appointed one or more ministers for the purpose, which raised the level of a minister's calling quite highly. Calvin himself wrote, saying, quote, The responsibility of providing pastoral care to people infected by the plague invariably placed a sharp relief, the gravity of the minister's calling and the personal costs that came with it, end quote. Plague casualties could number as much, listen to this, as a third of a city's population. And spending time among the sick increased one's likelihood of contracting the disease because the hospitals were incubators for the disease, as has even been affirmed today. Pastoral visits to the quarantine were potentially fatal, and the ravages of the plague in Geneva would continue into 1544. 
The hospital would require constant visitation by ministers, and Geneva sought ministers to voluntary take on hospital visitation, and in the course of their duty, several contracted the disease and within weeks were taken away. Now look, no one wanted to die. But in the fulfillment of their ministerial duties, just like this nurse in Hollywood, these were willing to serve the sick and dying, risking their own lives to supply what was lacking in their service for Christ on behalf of others, in the case of these Genevan ministers. Now, our local medical facilities preclude visitations of the sick by anyone, including clergy. But that said, I am grateful to God, as I know all you are, that not one member of our humble congregation or anyone I know has contracted the present virus and would like for me to visit them. Pastoral visitation is one of the great privileges I've enjoyed over these many years as your pastor. And I deeply long for that experience again, to share time in your home. Time when the time calls for it at your hospital bed, either in the emergency room or in your hospital room. That has been among the most wonderful and treasured experiences of my ministerial vocation. Holding the hands of those as they pass away into the arms of Jesus. Being with the sick and dying as they're receiving hospice care. Visiting them in the hospital when they're recovering from a surgery. Caring for them when they're in, in that condition. And many over the centuries have faced far greater risks than I could ever imagine in their pastoral ministry of visitation. Well, as we come to this passage, we are again reminded that not all faithful people in God's sight are famous in the sight of the world. Those pictured on the front covers of grocery store aisle tabloids have their day in the sun and fade as desert blossoms. But those who eternally, those uh, who work for God, have their names written in his book of life. And some such eternally significant souls include the likes of Phoebe, who delivered the book of Romans, Tychicus, who delivered the epistles to the Ephesians and Colossians, and escorted Onesimus with his version, his original, his autograph of Paul's letter to Philemon, his master. And then we also have Epaphroditus, who took this letter to Paul's beloved friends in Philippi. These are not commonly known personalities, even in the New Testament. Receive honorable mention, but they are recorded in heaven, and their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So, outside of the reference to him in this letter, Philippians 2, 25 through 30, and they also Philippians 4, 18, nothing more is certain of Epaphroditus, who provides another like-minded example of one who is willing to go the distance for the sake of others. As Paul concludes here, not regarding his life. And such men, the Philippians, were to esteem. They were to imitate, as he gives that imperative in Philippians 3.17. Note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. And for us, the legacy of Epaphroditus is worth noting and his life worthy of our emulation. We all need models. We all need examples. And as we pointed out before, all of us are following someone. The big question is, who are you following? And, likewise, who is following you? We're in the middle. And every one of us needs to be, as it were, sandwiched in discipleship. Following someone, and someone following us. Epaphroditus would be someone to follow. Let's look at Epaphroditus. First thing we know is that he was a very special man. A very special man. Paul trusted in the Lord that he would soon be free to come to Philippi. He also hoped to send Timothy to them shortly. But notice that he considered it necessary to send Epaphroditus. What kind of man was he? And why the compulsion to return this man with the letter to the Philippians? Why the necessity 
I trust to send Timothy. I hope myself to come. But I've got to send this Epaphroditus. For what reason? Well, what we know of him is, is woven through this text and is found in Epaphroditus' bond to Paul and his relationship to the Philippians. This is what makes him a special man. First of all, concerning the Apostle Paul. Epaphroditus literally means favorite of Aphrodite. Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love. But Paul identifies Epaphroditus by three even more wonderful names, each referring to what is held in common between Christians who are like-minded. The favorite of Aphrodite was first of all, and even more significantly, a brother. A brother to the Apostle Paul. My brother. We see here that in his relationship to the Apostle Paul, the two of them shared a common affection. This takes us back to chapter 2 and verse 1. If any affection and mercy, fellowship of the Spirit. We are brothers, Paul says here. And the first reference to Epaphroditus is that he is my brother, Paul says. What an enduring term. What a familial term. One that conveys notions of love. A friend loves at all times, the Bible says, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17, 17. And Epaphroditus approved to be just such a friend. Also, they labored in a common work. He is my fellow worker, Sunergos. We are companions in labor, he says. A very special title. Very special title. As Paul applies it to those in his extended greetings in Romans chapter 16, like Priscilla and Aquila, Urbanus and Timothy, Romans 16, 3, 9, and 21. He refers to Apollos and himself as God's fellow workers in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. Silvanus, Timothy, and Titus are also regarded as fellow workers according to 2 Corinthians 1, 24 and chapter 8, 23. Clement and other fellow workers are referred to in Philippians 4, verse 3, whose names are in the book of life. In Colossians 4.11, the apostle remarks about Aristarchus, Mark, Jesus, who is called Justice, who are fellow workers. Again, Timothy is so referred to in Philippians, I'm sorry, in 1 Thessalonians 3.20. Philemon, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke are also among Paul's fellow laborers, referred to as such in Philemon 1, verse 1, and verse 24. The Apostle John goes on to say in 3 John 1, 8, that when we support missionaries, we are also fellow workers for the truth. So Epaphroditus receives honorable mention. He is on the trophy case. He is on the shelf of God's fellow workers, those esteemed by that wonderful title. Among Paul's fellow workers whose names are in the book of life, Philippians 4, 3, and labored in this common work. Also, they were engaged in a common warfare. Paul and Epaphroditus were fellow soldiers. The phrase fellow soldier is one word in the original and is applied to but one other in the New Testament. Archippus, Philemon 1 verse 1, perhaps the son of Philemon and Aphia who led their house church. By this title, fellow soldier. Paul associates this man with the labor and conflicts in the cause of Christ. As Paul would say in uh, Philippians 1, uh, 20, uh, 27, striving together for the faith of the gospel, not in any way terrified by your adversaries. Uh, verse 29, it has been granted for you to suffer for his sake having the same conflict. These are war terms. These are terms of conflict. In the language of 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, Epaphroditus endured hardship as a good soldier, kept himself from the entanglements of everyday life, and pleased the one who had listened to him as a soldier. All of these traits, again, point to the aim of this chapter. As each of us should be concerning one another, so Paul was with Epaphroditus and him with the Apostle. One with each other in sympathy. One with each other in work. One with each other in danger. 
Epaphroditus had indeed stood with Paul in the firing line. He was, as the saying goes, one to ride the river with. Or as was the unwritten code of the Old West that veteran cowboys expected of new ranch hands, Epaphroditus rode for the brand. In the American West, a brand is a ranch's trademark used to separate and document ownership of livestock. The brand represents pride, duty, and stewardship. It inspires loyalty and dedication, just like an American would raise his right hand and pledge allegiance to the American flag. Brands are used to permanently mark cattle, horses, and sometimes other livestock in spring and fall roundups where cattle are gathered on the ranges in order to brand and earmark the calves, wean, sort for ownership, and cut out those wanted for shipment to market. As to writing for a brand, cowboy poet Red Stiegel summed it up best in one of his poems that earned him recognition as the official cowboy poet of Texas. He wrote, Son, a man's brand is his own special mark that says this is mine. Leave it alone. You hire out to a man, ride for his brand and protect it like it was your own. The scripture teaches, beloved, that when a person receives Christ as Savior and Lord, God's seal or brand is affixed on his soul. He is marked, a marked man, branded with the name of Christ. He belongs to God. As Christians, we ride for his brand, and we protect his flock like it is our own. And Epaphroditus was just such a man who rode for the brand of Christ. Are you so inspired with loyalty and dedication to his brand? Will you ride for him? But there's a more local expression of Epaphroditus' commitment to the brand of Christ. For even today, there are many Christians who claim to ride for the brand of Jesus, but are disconnected from any real fellowship or, or uh, partnership, fellow workers in a local expression of the body of Christ. How tragic that one would say, I am a Christian and I ride for Jesus, but doesn't know how to get along with other Christians. Not this Epaphroditus, no way. A very special man. And concerning the Philippians, we move now next. Concerning the Philippians, not only did he ride for the brand of Christ, but he rode for the brand of the Philippian congregation. Epaphroditus' relationship to Paul was in direct connection to his association with the Philippian congregation. He may have been one of their pastors or deacons, as Paul refers to in Philippians 1. Tested in little things, he was proven in this greater work of delivering a special gift to the apostle. What was his relationship to the Philippian congregation? Well, Paul says he was their messenger. He was their messenger. A very significant term, by the way. The term used here is apostle, apostolos, which conveys obviously not the unique office held by those who saw the Lord and were thereby specially commissioned and sent by Jesus. He's not an apostle in that particular specialized sense. Rather, Epaphroditus was the Philippians' apostle, a delegate, one sent forth with orders and under the authority of the one who sent him. The idea of apostleship here is this, that when the Philippians sent this man, they were sending themselves. He was like their ambassador, having an assignment, a duty to fulfill a ministry on their behalf, to the Apostle Paul. He was their messenger. He was also the one who ministered to Paul, as we've said. Epaphroditus then, as an apostle of the Philippians, operated as a minister. Literally, as we saw in Philippians 2, uh, 17, where Paul speaks of his own being poured out as a sacrifice, uh, uh, as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of their faith. That term, service, translated uh, ministered to by need in verse 25, and also service in verse 30, is the word from which we get liturgical. He was acting in religious service, offering sacrifices. That's what this Epaphroditus was doing. It's the same term. We saw Paul use of his own service in Philippians 2.17, again, as I said, in Philippians 2 and verse 30. He ministered to Paul's need as one who was a priest of God, 
offering spiritual sacrifices, particularly in this case defined by meeting Paul's need. What is the lesson for us to learn? What's the lesson in this for us? It is this, beloved, that your service to the Lord might be arduous, but it will always be worth it. As the song says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Timothy was intended to be a special messenger from Rome to Philippi. So Epaphroditus had come as a special messenger from Philippi to Rome. You see, when it was decided that one of their own would bear this gift to the apostle, Epaphroditus volunteered. The love of Christ took possession and opened the heart of Epaphroditus to the need of his spiritual father and founder of the Philippian church. For his sake and the commission laid upon him, Epaphroditus was willing to leave behind friends and family in Christ behind and uh, brave all the natural dangers associated with first century travel as well as the probability, if not likelihood, of suffering persecution as a Christian and the one sent to minister to the Apostle Paul. What tenderness must have exchanged between the two of them as he came to Paul's rented quarters there in Rome and handed over to him the chained apostle, the contribution of the Philippian church. In Philippians 4.18, we see this again. Paul says, I have all. I abound. Philippians 4.18. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. A few years later, there was another who ministered to Paul. This man traveled even further from Ephesus to Rome. Perhaps on business, he had left his family and journeyed to Rome. And there, having spent great time, energy, finances, effort, and certain dangers, Onesiphorus came to see the Apostle Paul. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1, where we read of another like-minded messenger and minister to the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 16 through 18, speak of this Onesiphorus, who came to see the Apostle Paul at his own expense, and notably was not ashamed of Paul's change, chains, but sought the Apostle out and found him. Now the imprisonment Paul is undergoing here is much more severe than the one we read of in Acts 28. This was no really quarters thing. This was a dungeon. This was a dingy, miserable existence. And chained as a prisoner of Rome. That's how he would have been regarded now. Not able to receive visitors so freely as in the Acts 28 confinement, which he refers to in the book of Philippians. This is much more intense. And to associate with one in chains would have tarnished the reputation of this Onesiphorus. But he says here, the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Another man like this Epaphroditus is this Onesimus, or this uh, Onesiphorus. An amazing man. What a couple. What an amazing group of people. Like those to whom Paul refers in Philippians 2.21, who all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, this Onesiphorus selflessly served the apostle and refreshed him. Just like this Epaphroditus, both of these men received honorable mention in the word of God. And you too, my brother or sister, fellow worker, my fellow soldier, my fellow priestly servant of Christ's people, your name also is in the book of life. And your efforts for the owner of the brand 
will be so recognized in the day of Christ. And the Lord will grant to you that you also will find mercy from the Lord on that day. Oh, may we know very well how many ways we minister to one another in our own Ephesus. All that in Ephesians, or in, in uh, Philippians 2 and verse 25. Let's go secondly then to how Epaphroditus became a very sick man, verses 26 or 27. Back to Philippians 2, 26 or 27. Epaphroditus became a very sick man, and the servant's Christ mindedness here is evident by his concern over what others had heard about his condition. Less anxious, apparently, about his illness than he was about what the Philippians had heard. What kind of sickness afflicted the Macedonian messenger? Let's find out. Well, first of all, it was a distressing sickness. Verse 26, he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Please note that the sickness, as awful as it was, did not distress the one afflicted. Rather, it was such a sickness that when others heard about Epaphroditus' condition, he was concerned about their anxiety over it. It was really bad. Infant mortality was very high. I, I read just yesterday that, that uh, parents, although they rejoiced when a child was born, were careful not to become too personally attached to that child until the child learned to walk and talk for fear of losing that child so quickly to infant death and the plague and the sickness and all kinds of things were so rampant in those early years. It was hard, really hard on people. Well, let's talk about the sickness for a moment. Today, we know that the quickest means to get from Rome to Philippi, or Philippi to Rome for that matter, is to fly. It takes about seven hours and 12 minutes. But not in the first century Roman Empire. No way. To get from where you are to where you want to be, you walked. Somehow along the 800-mile trip, Epaphroditus had come down sick. And the Philippians heard about this. Perhaps while on his way to Rome, he became sick and attracted to express the Philippians' concern. In the meanwhile, as weeks passed, he recovered, but the messenger returned to inform Epaphroditus about the church and how upset they were over what had transpired. Oh, this is terrible. I was sick. I was bad sick. But the Philippians heard about my sickness, and they were very distressed that I was distressed. Oh, this is terrible. You see the guy's unselfish devotion to others. Not so distressed about his sickness, but distressed about the distress of others because he was sick. <laughs> This whole thing likely took months to transpire given travel times and the limitations of first century communication. He couldn't just get a smartphone out and text and say, I'm sick, uh, pray for me. The word about the Philippian church and some of their needs addressed in this letter would have been brought to Paul by Epaphroditus as well as by uh, the other messengers, uh, probably others that came to and from, back and forth to uh, Rome and Philippi. But let's also point out, not only was he distressed because they had heard that he was sick, but this was a, a deadly sickness, a deadly sickness. You see, during the imperial period of Rome, disease was a harsh reality of life. As the borders of the empire continuously expanded and the population steadily grew, cities in the Roman Empire were exposed to a multitude of diseases. The city of Rome a high population urban center was a hub of diseases. Trade and an influx of foreigners made it inevitable that every disease known to the empire would find its way to the city. All roads lead to Rome and carry their sickness with it. The afflictions ranged in severity, some being catastrophic, others not being quite as deadly. Malaria and tuberculosis are thought to have been very common in ancient Rome. Malaria in particular is believed to have been a very serious problem because Rome and many other Roman cities were surrounded by mosquito breeding marshes and people were dying of malaria by the thousands in Italy, even on into the 20th century. Parasites bred in the unsanitary culture and chronic respiratory disease was a common malady. Let me also point out from the Greek that the term rendered sick, astheneo, A-S-T-H-E-N-E-O, astheneo, is a very strong word. 
It does not convey the notion of a common cold or general weakness and fatigue, but something really bad, very weak. In fact, figuratively speaking, the apostle writes to this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, saying that the law was weak through the flesh, so weak that what we could not do by the law, weak as it was through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on account of sin, he condemned sin to the flesh. The law was so weak to save us that God had to save us by killing his own son on our behalf. That's how weak it was. And this term ostinato is used 36 times in the New Testament, many times, many times in reference to physical illness. In fact, every time it appears in the Gospels, it refers to physical sickness that received miraculous healing by Christ or his apostles. In Matthew 10 and verse 8, it is joined with other signs, such as cleansing lepers, raising the dead, and casting out demons. In Matthew 25 and verse 36, tribulation saints, it says there, will visit the sick. In Mark 6 and verse 56, it says that wherever Jesus entered into villages, cities or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. In Luke 4 and verse 40, it echoes saying that when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. In Luke 7 and verse 10, the term refers to a servant who was sick and ready to die. In John chapter 5, verses 3 and 7, Ostheneto appears in reference to a man who had been severely afflicted for some 38 years and was associated with others of multiple sicknesses, blindness, lameness, paralysis. Of particular word study importance, is John 11, verses 1 through 3, where Ostheneto is applied to Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, who was sick, died, and was buried for four days before Jesus raised him from the dead. When coming to the book of Acts, we see Tabitha in Acts chapter 9, who became sick and died, but who was raised again by the apostle Peter. In Acts chapter 19, verse 12, it says of Paul that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Outside of Acts, the term appears a few more times in connection to physical sickness, three times by the Apostle Paul, and once by James. In these cases, ostinato refers to physical sickness. Very serious. Here in Philippians 2, 25 and 30, it is a deadly illness or sickness. In James chapter 5 and verse 14, church leaders are instructed on how they are to pray for the sick. The context there referring to the suffering brought about by Christian persecution, which may have resulted in physical suffering, even spiritual suffering and discouragement. But I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20, where it says, very interestingly, Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. There's our word, ostineo. And what is so fascinating here is how this Christian man, this Trophimus, a faithful servant of Christ who had been with Paul, faithfully serving, sacrificing, ministering, you can read of him in Acts 20, verse 4, and Acts 21, verse 29. Again, like Epaphroditus, one to ride for the brand. The apostle, in this case, did not heal, nor did he refer to him as being treated with the Lord's mercy. Isn't that something? In one case, one deathly ill, but the Lord had mercy on and delivered him. In the other case, another deathly ill, but left sick. Let's return to Philippians chapter 2 and see then how this sickness was defeated. It was a defeated sickness. Now, we do not know, nor is the text definitive as to the means of Epaphroditus' recovery. Was he miraculously healed by Paul's giftedness as an apostle? Paul healed the sick. We just read these various verses where he healed those who were sick. 
But in this case, probably not. First of all, consider that Paul speaks of experiencing sorrow, even sorrow upon sorrow. He speaks later of being less sorrowful because he returned Epaphroditus to them. Pain and grief of heart are never associated with one who can turn on his gift of healing. Otherwise, it would be Epaphroditus was deathly ill, but praise God, I laid hands on him and he was healed. Can you imagine the reaction of the Roman guard chained to Paul as he laid hands on Epaphroditus and healed him of this deathly illness? No, I don't think that's the case at all. Paul is saying here that he was sorrowful because his beloved saint had made the trip from Philippi to Rome and had done so for him. Now, Epaphroditus had come down sick, suffering in Paul's presence. Just think of it. If he had died, sorrow upon sorrow. We can only guess what Paul's referring to by the first level of sorrow. The conditions of his confinement, unable to get around. And now chained, you know, all this carrying on, the sorrow. And now the additional sorrow would have been piled on with the loss of a long time friend and dear brother in Christ. Sorrow upon sorrow I faced because this beloved brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier had come down sick and was dying. No doubt Paul did not exercise his miraculous gift of healing, I say. If that gift was free and readily available for use by Christians on behalf of other Christians, Paul would have applied it much earlier in this case, and not let Epaphroditus become so deathly ill. Second, we know from the evidence in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 20, that not every Christian who took ill was healed by the one with the gift of healing. Paul, we know, had the gift. But that enablement was not necessarily given to heal Christians of their physical problems. In the case of Trophimus, the apostle left him sick, deathly ill. It is also ridiculous to argue that Epaphroditus finally generated enough faith to rightly claim the physical healing supposedly guaranteed him in the atonement. Trophimus, however, was left unhealed, as some might argue, because of unconfessed sin or because of being out of God's will or just unable to muster the faith to name it and claim it. Baloney! Come on! That doesn't make any sense. You can't fit that kind of warp... Theology in these verses. The popular error of the Pentecostal teaching that the gift of healing can be turned on during weekly Wednesday evening prayer meetings or that those with faith to be healed can claim what is rightly theirs is just plain bogus. God never made such promises. And Paul, Epaphroditus, Timothy, who was told to take a little bit of wine for his stomach's sake and his frequent ailments, 1 Timothy 5.23, and Trophimus here in 2 Timothy 4.20 would most certainly concur. One commentator has rightly assessed that there was no indication that Paul could heal him or that he tried to do so. Neither is there any hint that Epaphroditus was sick because of being out of God's will. All right then. How was he healed? Miraculously? No. Well, how, how, how then was this sickness defeated? Was Epaphroditus a physically strong man? Probably. Probably a very strong guy. Given the 20 or more miles a day he would have had to walk from Philippi to arrive in Rome along the Ignatian Way a little over a month later. The man was determined. He was commissioned. He was motivated. Physically fit. Otherwise, the Philippians would never have trusted him with the gift. You don't send a sick man or a guy given over to sickness all the way to walk 800 miles to deliver a gift. This guy was in shape, at least when he left Philippi. Perhaps in his case, the sickness went away. Is that how it It just sort of, you know, lost oomph. There was no divine intervention necessary, no need to call on God, just one of those things where in Epaphroditus' case, things just worked out for the good for him. Paul would not suggest such a thing either. That's a naturalist viewpoint, entirely foreign to the apostles' theology. No natural causes could possibly be adequate to explain what Epaphroditus experienced. 
was Epaphroditus healed by medical care? We don't know for certain, but perhaps Luke, the beloved physician, was still here, referred to as one of Paul's fellow workers with him when he writes the books of Colossians and Philemon. Maybe he was still here. Even with the possibility that Luke, the beloved physician, was still with Paul, look, far fewer people in antiquity recover from death's door. You get ostineo, you don't recover. That's typically, typically what's the case. A reality difficult for us to grasp in our age of modern medicine. No, again, this is not entirely probable. Well, how can we know that Epaphroditus was healed? In what way, what means? How was he restored to make that long journey back to Philippi and continue ministering? How do we know? Paul tells us, look, here's the lesson. Look, let us grieve for the sick, but also acknowledge God's mercy. Look, was Epaphroditus physically strong? In all likelihood, yes, even as we should endeavor as much as possible to keep our bodies you know, capable to work for as long as possible? Yes. Did Paul pray for the recovery of Epaphroditus? Of course he did, even as he would have for his friend Trophimus. Even as we should when our loved ones and fellow workers are suffering from physical disease. Is God able to exercise such mercy? Of course he is. We've never denied that possibility. Did Paul seek out whatever medical care might have been available for his friend? Of course, even as we should when our loved ones are suffering from physical disease. But the point to learn here is that this, sorrow is real, and it is acceptable before God, even for the most gifted of Christians, to grieve when the life of a dear one is on the brink of death. Sorrow upon sorrow is perfectly normal, and it is good. Remember our Lord Jesus, who wept outside the tomb of his friend Lazarus. But secondly, when one recovers, as we have seen many with this COVID-19 thing, sick and recover, we praise God and we ought to praise God, giving the glory to him. He and he alone, sometimes miraculously, but normally through means, is able to both either take away or restore life. When all this came down, Paul praying, Epaphroditus and his fellow worker, his brother and fellow soldier, must have rejoiced with the psalmist, who in Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, who heals all your diseases. Psalm 91 teaches also that nothing can harm the child of God unless the Lord permits. And perhaps as this plague passed from Epaphroditus and he regained his strength by the Lord's mercy, perhaps the Apostle Paul brought to his mind and to the ear of his dear friend, surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. And so on. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. These are not blanket promises, as though God guarantees healing, miraculous healing. But he is the one who does show mercy. And then his timing is perfect timing. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, in this present time, some are suffering from infection to COVID-19. Some of these Christians who serve in the name of the Lord and for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ are left sick in their own Miletus. Whereas most of them recover, even reporting that their symptoms were mild, others have died from the disease. The Bible would direct us to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and not lean upon our own understanding and to direct our prayers to the Lord who died and lives forevermore and has the keys of death and Hades. That's what Epaphroditus would instruct us. That's a valuable lesson, friends, a valuable 
lesson. Let's move on finally then, verses 28 through 30, to have Epaphroditus returned, a very celebrated man. Paul's report dispelled any rumor of Epaphroditus' failing to complete his mission. Actually, just the opposite was true. The apostle was happy to return this dear servant and expected two things of the Philippians. Receive him and respect him. Philippians chapter 2, 28 through 30. Therefore I ascend him the more eagerly that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So quickly, the Philippians were to gladly receive Epaphroditus. Here the underlying, underlying tone of the letter comes through again with such terms as rejoice, verse 28, and gladness. All gladness. Even Paul's reference to being less sorrowful complements the theme of joy in the Lord that dominates this letter. Also, the Philippians were to highly regard their messenger and the one who ministered to Paul's need. The man returned to his friends with this letter and practically received a hero's welcome. Not regarding his life. Not regarding his life renders two key words. The first, a compound word of the preposition, para, meaning alongside, and the verb, baluamai, meaning to consider oneself. The two words compound the meaning to refer to one not high, not regarding his own life as one who rashly exposes himself to dangers to be venturesome even reckless what did epaphroditus not regard he did not regard his own life his own soul his present life on earth his own soul the apostle uses a verb here which is a gambler's term and means to stake everything on a turn of the dice. Paul is saying here that for the sake of Jesus Christ, Epaphroditus willingly gambled his life. That's what he's saying here. What's our lesson? What is the valuable lesson in all this? Let me give it to you. Here it is. The lesson to learn is this. Let us follow examples of reckless selflessness for Christ's sake. You know, I think in our own church of missionaries like Ted and Dana Whitmer who have selflessly, recklessly served the cause of Christ in Bunya. And of Linda and Craig Troop and their family recklessly, selflessly serving the cause of Christ in Bible translation and church planting these some 30 years in New Guinea. Selfless, reckless servants not regarding their own lives for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. In which ways do you and I recklessly, selflessly serve the needs of Christ as we ride for his brand and for his church? We see then here two amazing personalities. In the first instance, we see Epaphroditus who took a gamble on his own life and almost lost it in his selfless devotion to another Christian and the fulfillment of his apostleship from the church in Philippi. In the second place, Here's the Apostle Paul, unsure of his sentence of life or death, but apparently so unconcerned about his case that he eagerly returns his friend to the Philippians. These are two selfless servants of the Savior, almost stumbling over one another in their exercise of mutual affection, mutual work, and mutual warfare. Let me explain as we conclude that in the days of the early church, there was an association of men and women known as the Parabalani, the gamblers. These aimed to visit the prisoners and the sick, especially those who were ill with dangerous and infectious diseases. In A.D. 252, during a time of remarkable political chaos, military weakness, and overall breakdown of the empire's infrastructure, a plague broke out, uh, broke out in Carthage, located in the northern African country of Tunisia today, but part of the Roman Empire at that time. 
the heathens threw out bodies of their dead and fled in terror. But there was a Christian pastor, a bishop actually, an overseer of several churches in Carthage, by the name of Cyprian, who gathered his congregation together and set them to bury the dead and nurse the sick in that plague-stricken city. And by so doing, they saved the city at the risk of their own lives from destruction and desolation. The pestilence aptly called the Plague of Cyprian from 219 to 262. He was a pastor. Cyprian was a preacher. Cyprian was an evangelist. And Cyprian described the plague that ravaged that, that part of the world for, what was it now, some 40 years. This is what he says. Listen to this. This is a plague. Cyprian, writing between 249 and 262, writes of the, uh, the plague and of mortality. These are reduced as proof of faith that the strength of the body is dissolved, the bowels dissipate in a flow, that a fire that begins in the inmost depths burns up into wounds in the throat, that the intestines are shaking with continuous vomiting, that the eyes are set on fire from the force of the blood, that the infection of the deadly putrefaction cuts off the feet or other extremities of some, and that as weakness prevails through the failures and losses of the bodies, the gait is crippled or the hearing is blocked and the vision is blinded, carrying off day by day with abrupt attack, numberless people, everyone from his own house. Now that, my friends, is a plague. And it lasted for some 40 years. And Cyprian and his congregants ministered to the sick and dying at the risk of their own lives, recklessly, selflessly devoted themselves to the cause of Christ. To put it more plainly, the disease pathology of Cyprian's plague included fatigue, bloody stools, fever, esophageal lesions, vomiting, conjunctival hemorrhaging, and severe infection in the extremities, debilitation, loss of hearing, and blindness following in the aftermath. During these days of widespread untold suffering, Bishop Cyprian delivered a sermon entitled on the mortality. And in it, the fiery preacher is set out to strengthen the faith of believers and to warn sinners who refuse to embrace the salvation found alone in Jesus Christ. This is what he says. Quote, Dearest brethren, the kingdom of God has begun to be nigh at hand. The reward of life and joy of eternal salvation and perpetual happiness and possession of paradise lately lost already while the world passes away are coming nigh. Already, heavenly things are succeeding to earthly and great to small and eternal to transient. What place is here for anxiety and solicitude? Who among these things is tremulous and mournful except in whom hope and faith are wanting? It is for him to be afraid of death who hath not willing to come to Christ and for him to be unwilling to come to Christ who does not believe that he has begun to reign with Christ. Doubtless, let him fear to die, and only him who unborn of water and the spirit is the property of hellfire. Let him fear to die, who is without title in the cross and passion of Christ. Let him fear to die, who is to pass from death here into the second death. Let him fear to die, on whom at his ongoing away from life in eternal flame will lay pains that never cease. Let him fear to die, on whom the longer delay confers this boon, that his tortures and groans will begin later. There are many among ourselves who die in this pestilence, however. There are many among us who are at liberty from the life below. This pestilence as to Jews and heathens and Christ's enemies, it is a plague. So too the servants of God is its departure to their salvation. That without distinction between man and man, the just and the unjust die alike. Think not because of this, that the good and the wicked pass to the same end. The righteous are called to the refreshing, the unrighteous hurried into punishment. The faithful obtain a speedier deliverance, the unbelieving speedier retribution. Unquote. What is faithful Cyprian saying? His point is plain, beloved. All die 
Righteous and wicked alike die. And there is an eternal place fit for all. Heaven and blessing for those who trust in Jesus Christ. And hell and cursing for those who refuse to come. Come, Cyprian would say. Come, the Lord Jesus Christ would say. Come, the Apostle Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, and Trophimus would say. Come, do not delay. You will die, if not by COVID-19, by some other plague of sin and corruption. Now is the day of salvation. Do not put the Lord Jesus Christ off. Christian, as you see this world passing away, Give yourself over to reckless selflessness. Gamble your life away in the service of your Savior. He loves you and he died for your sins. And on the day of Christ, you will hear, as you stand next to the likes of Epaphroditus, well done, you good and faithful servant. Praise God for these remarkable examples. And I urge you, brethren, to join in following these examples and note those who so walk as you have them for a pattern. May the Lord so enable us to be worthy patterns for others to follow as well. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we pray for the lost today that they will find their salvation and peace and comfort in knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, the one who died for us and rose again that we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. We pray, Father, for strength for those who serve on the front lines, for our friend Michelle Parsons in Chicago, who continues to serve. We pray that you will draw her nearer to you and give her strength and fortitude as she continues to serve the sick and dying in Chicago. For those in our local hospitals, local COVID-19 units who continue to serve, we pray for your hand of protection upon them and for all of their needs for personal protective equipment to be met. We pray for wisdom for our national and state leaders and local governors and mayors and city council people and county officials. We pray you'll give them wisdom, Lord, as our economy begins to open up carefully and with others and their health in mind. Father, we pray you would continue to keep our church together and give us joy in our mutual rejoicings and fellowship as you give us opportunity to meet with one another, to share prayer requests, to pray with one another, and to study your word. Be with us, we pray, Lord, and as the coming week unfolds, may we be found faithful in our reckless, selfless devotion to the cause of our Savior as we ride for his brand. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Lord's Day. And go with God. Have a marvelous week and a great day. Thank you for joining us. God bless you.